Last uh, session in our discussion of the future of democracy, can't think of anybody who's a more appropriate uh, cleanup hitter, if you will, than uh, my guest, uh, Secretary Leon Panetta. He has served in so many different capacities, uh, helping our country as a member of Congress, uh, c committee chairman, director of the Office of Management and Budget, White House Chief of Staff, CIA Director and Secretary of Defense now runs the Panetta Institute, which is doing good in all sorts of uh, uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan ways. Um, Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, get started by talking about the thing that's on all of our minds. I'm going to repeat the uh, injunction. Ask us questions from the audience or from the, the live stream audience. Uh, send them to uh, hashtag uh, post live. Uh, and we will process them and put them to Secretary Panetta. So, Mr. Secretary, this morning we watched uh, President Trump arrive in Brussels, just, you know, practically smoke coming out of his ears, uh, sat down to, to breakfast with the NATO Secretary General, Jans Stoltenberg, and uh, talked about uh, how Germany was a captive of Russia and uh, all of the familiar lines about how the Europeans aren't paying their way. Um, I always remember hearing when I was growing up that when we thought about the future of democracy, we should think about NATO and our European allies and that structure of friendships and alliances that was about the future of democracy and keeping it going. What, what, what did you think uh, as you listened to President Trump's rhetoric uh, yesterday on his way to Brussels this morning? What would, what, what's your reaction to that and how do you think our allies will react? Well, first of all, it's good to be with you, David. Uh, David's uh, tracked me for a long time uh, here in Washington, and uh, we've always had a great relationship, and I thank you for doing this. Um, I, you know, I, I, I worry a great deal about uh, where this is all headed. Um, it is, in many ways, it fits a pattern uh, for, for the president. I think... This president, who's not steeped in history uh, or steeped in foreign policy, is someone who likes to react, obviously based on his gut instincts. But his reaction is always to create disruption uh, and to operate with chaos. And part of that, I think, goes back to something you, know, you, you mentioned in your column in the Washington Post, which is this kind of New York developer mentality, because that's been most of his life, which is to operate on the basis of challenging people, criticizing people, demanding things, uh, and knowing that ultimately uh, the more he can antagonize and create disruption, that ultimately people will come around uh, and come back to the table and, because there's money on the table and try to work out some deal. Uh, the problem I see is that he creates this chaos, which, by the way, I mean, tactically, I understand that chaos uh, can be helpful. But what concerns me is strategic chaos, where there is no strategy as to where it's going. So you, you get rid of TTP, but where's the strategy to deal with that? You get rid of NAFTA, but where's the strategy to repair that? Uh, you create a trade war and increase tariffs, but where is that taking us? Uh, you, you move away from climate change, but where is the strategy to deal with that? Uh, you get rid of the Iran agreement, but where is the strategy to deal with that? And I have a sense that he's applying that same kind of approach when it comes to NATO, which is to create a lot of disruption, to kind of challenge these countries to, you know, and, and look, I, I do believe that uh, these countries obviously have have to meet their responsibility to NATO. Uh, I think he actually deserves some credit for getting some of these countries to come forward uh, and begin to respond with their 2% uh, requirement. But what he's missing is that, you know, this isn't just a country club where people have to pay their dues. This is an alliance of allies uh, that, you know, has a 70 year history that is critical to uh, the security, not only of the United States, but uh, the security of Europe and the world. And he's got to keep coming back 
to that fundamental point. He's not doing that. He's basically criticizing, he's pushing them, uh, he's making the kind of statements that he made this morning. You, and what concerns me, as I said, is where the hell are we going with this? What is the long-term strategy? Is he trying to undermine NATO? Is he trying to weaken NATO? Or, you know, deep down, is he trying to use this as a tactic to hopefully strengthen NATO for the future? So, uh, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you the question I was puzzling over this morning. Um, I've traveled to NATO summits with you in the past, if memory serves, and uh, I wondered this morning whether we were getting near the tipping point, where at some point people say, you know, he's been banging on us now for a year and a half. I'm beginning to believe it. I believe that he doesn't really believe in NATO. And so at that moment, if you're a European, you say, we need to think about other ways to guarantee our security. The American commitment to defend us with nuclear weapons, if necessary, is no longer... How close are we to that tipping point where people say, we got to make other plans? Well, I think one thing that could very well happen in these next few days is that it may very well define uh, Trump foreign policy uh, for the duration of his term as president. Uh, and it can go one of two ways. Uh, if he takes advantage of the fact that the European countries are coming forward, uh, tries to take steps to strengthen the NATO alliance, uh, to provide the kind of military assistance and deployments that are important to keeping that alliance strong. He could use that as a strong point in going to the summit with Putin. I think it could strengthen his hand in dealing with Putin. Uh, and then ask, obviously, deal with Putin on some of the critical issues that uh, we confront with Russia. That, that is something we should hope for as the, the path that he will take. On the other hand, it could be a disaster. And he could very well wind up uh, in NATO, uh, continuing his criticism, uh, demanding that if they don't pay, that uh, the United States uh, will somehow withdraw uh, in terms of the numbers of uh, military personnel and, and equipment that uh, we provide to NATO. Uh, so he could really send a torpedo into the strength of NATO, weaken NATO, and then go trotting off to, uh, to Russia uh, and have a great reality TV meeting with, uh, with Putin, similar to what happened with the G7 and then going to Kim. I think it, if, if that repeats itself, then I think Europe and our allies will have a very clear message that this president is not interested in trying to strengthen the alliance, uh, but rather weaken it. And, and not, not to push you too, too hard, but, but after this first uh, morning, uh, as we watched it, um, it, it looks to me like this, the latter scenario, the, the torpedo scenario, <laughs> seems a lot more, more likely than the former. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, this guy is totally unpredictable and erratic, and I have no damn idea what the <laughs> hell is going to happen here. I mean, I, you know, I watched the president uh, with the Supreme Court announcement. Uh, he followed his lines. He behaved himself. He did well. <laughs> I mean, you know, as a former chief of staff, that's what you want presidents to do. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he, he does seem to have at least the ability to uh, adhere to uh, that kind of, you know, of, of big moment. Now, on the other hand, he's, you know, by virtue of his tweeting and the way he behaves in other areas and the criticisms that he makes and the personal attacks that he engages in, uh, that's the other side here. And I, you know, whether or not, I mean, look, the most encouraging thing is that he's surrounded by Pompeo, Mattis, and John Kelly happens to be there, who is somebody I work, work with. Work with Secretary Panetta. And, uh, you know, particularly Mattis and Kelly, who are two Marines, uh, ultimately, I think, you know, can 
they're trying to keep him on the right track. And whether they're successful or not, you know, we'll see. But at least I'm somewhat encouraged that he has the right people at the table beside him. Uh, but obviously, he's still not following their lines. So <laughs> that you may just have given the kiss of death to poor <laughs> General Kelly and General Mattis. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but let, let me ask you um, what's in some ways an awkward question, but it's, it's, it's an appropriate question for a, a former CIA director. It's written often that uh, Donald Trump's behavior towards Putin support, encouragement, uh, being friends is a good thing, and his behavior toward our traditional allies, Chancellor Merkel, Prime Minister Theresa May, is consistent with someone who is acting on behalf of Russia's interests. Obviously, these are questions that in the end will be left to uh, Robert Mueller and his investigation. But if you could just speak from your perspective as a former CIA director about ways in which people sometimes, wittingly or unwittingly, end up acting in ways that help foreign powers, I think that would be an interesting way to look at this question. Well, look, I, you know, I've been in public life uh, over 50 years, and I served uh, in one way or another with uh, nine presidents. Uh, and every one of those presidents uh, recognized Russia for what it is uh, and understood that they were an adversary and that we had to be, we had to defend our interests in dealing with Russia because from all of the intelligence that we gather on Russia, there is no question that they continue to make efforts to undermine our democracy, to undermine Western democracies. That's pretty clear. Uh, this president doesn't like to read his PDBs, but I'm sure that every briefing that is provided to him mentions the fact that Russia is engaged in efforts to undermine our democracy. And so the fact that this president kind of goes out of his way to try to, in many ways, defend Putin. When Putin says that Russia was not involved in something that all of our intelligence agencies agree that they were involved with, which was to try to undermine our election institution in this country. And Putin says, no, no, we weren't involved. And the President of the United States says, well, you know, I kind of take his word that they weren't involved. When all of the evidence and all of the intelligence and all of the evidence is that, in fact, they were involved. And obviously, that raises concerns. Uh, what those concerns are, you know, I, I don't know. Bob Mueller obviously will determine whether there's a money connection or whether there's anything else that truly is influencing him. But I think. The bigger issue is this, that he is, Donald Trump is president of the United States. He has sworn an oath not only to defend our Constitution, but to protect this country. And I think for that reason alone, the president of the United States has to protect our country from our adversaries. I always felt as CIA director and as Secretary of Defense, my primary mission was to keep America safe, to protect our country. And that's what presidents of the United States are responsible to do. And I worry that this president, for whatever reason, is not operating with the awareness of how much an adversary Russia is to the stability of the United States. That's a, a powerful answer, uh, and I, I'll, I'll leave that there and turn to uh, a related question. You're uh, experienced in the process of bringing order out of chaos, and I'm thinking back to when uh, a talented but uh, somewhat disorganized president named Bill Clinton 
uh, was in a lot of uh, trouble after his first couple of years in office. And you came in as his chief of staff in a situation, an environment which a lot of people thought there's no way. Even Leon Panetta is not going to be able to, to discipline this. And uh, you, you had some success. And I think it would be interesting for this audience just to hear a little bit about how you did that and what rules you laid down to impose some discipline on a talented but undisciplined man. How did you do that? It wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I, I was uh, OMB director, and we had just passed a very significant budget uh, for, for the president that, uh, by the way, provided $500 billion in deficit reduction over five years. What's the uh, deficit reduction? <laughs> we don't remember that. And the combination of that plus the Bush agreement uh, is what produced a balanced budget. So I, I was very pleased with uh, the opportunity to work on the budget and work on appropriations bills. And, uh, you know, I, actually Vice President Gore, who was a classmate of mine in Congress, uh, said, I think the president wants you to be chief of staff. And I said, uh, Al, I, I'm, I'm much more valuable as OMB director. Uh, besides that, I kind of knew the, the chaos in the White House. And uh, so I... The next thing I knew, I was being invited up to uh, Camp David. Uh, and uh, so I, I flew up to Camp David, and I walked into the presidential cabin, and it was President Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, and Tipper Gore, and me. I knew I was screwed at that point. <laughs> uh, and so uh, at the end of that conversation, I said, okay, I'll, I'll take the job. Uh, and uh, I had some conditions. Uh, but the most important was that you, I had to establish a chain of command. I remember uh, asking my predecessor, uh, Mac McClarty, uh, is you know, get, give me your organization chart for the White House. And he said, you know, I don't, I don't believe we have one of those. <laughs> and I, I knew I was in trouble at that point. Uh, so I took my Army experience, developed a chain of command, uh, where you have chief of staff, deputy chiefs of staff, people responsible to people, not having people wander around into the Oval Office, these kind of uh, people that carry a broad title and can walk into any meeting, have no responsibility and walk out. That's a lousy way to run the White House. So I, I developed uh, that kind of approach along with uh, trying to control, obviously, uh, uh, access to the president. The key difference was that this president wanted that discipline to happen. He, he knew that in many ways, his reelection would depend on that. And so he was very cooperative uh, in the effort to try to put uh, those changes in place. And uh, it was not always easy. Uh, you know, he is he's somebody who just instinctively wants to reach out to people, wants everybody to come into the Oval Office and talk and uh, be a part of it. So you had to discipline that. And I think he was willing to accept that discipline and as a result, I think we were able to really put it in, in a better place. I, I remember you know, talking to John Kelly, who called me before he took his job. And I said, you know, I, I went through the whole thing. I said, you've got to put a chain of command in place. You've got to limit access. You have, a, have to have a policy process that you put in place for the president. I said, the big difference, John, is, is your principle. And whether or not, in the end, he's going to be willing to accept that kind of discipline. That will be the difference between success or failure. So we keep uh, hearing reports of friction between uh, General Kelly and the president, uh, and yet he, he stays on. Um, and I've wondered what would be the consequence if one day General Kelly decided, this just isn't working, sir, with the greatest respect, you know, and walked out the door, or the president fired him, and decided that he didn't want to operate with the chief of staff. I mean, let's face it, he's kind of, that's not working out very well, the chief of staff process. What, what would that be like? What would a White House without a chief of staff with this very headstrong president, can you just 
give us a word picture of what that would be like? Well, you know, it would again be chaos. <laughs> and, but, uh, but the president likes that kind of approach. And, uh, you know, and I think he basically, has, he may very well have arrived at a point where he thinks, I really don't need a chief of staff. I can basically, I know this job now. Uh, and I can basically handle it uh, without a chief of staff. And the, and the Leon Panetta, who's sitting on his, on his shoulder, who's been given an opportunity to whisper something in his, President Trump's ear, would say, Mr. President? Mr. President, uh, no, matter, no matter how you've operated in the private sector, uh, no matter how you've operated as President of the United States, you absolutely need to have a chief of staff that can implement uh, the things that you want to do, can organize the staff, and make it respond to you and to uh, what you need done. Uh, you can't operate uh, without some discipline. I don't, I don't care who you are. Uh, you need to have uh, an organiz organized approach to dealing with these issues. And yeah, you know, the president. The President of the United States uh, is the elected individual in this country, uh, and he determines what, what policies are. But the reality is that no president uh, can operate without a support foundation in which you have advisors and key people that know these issues, that present options to the president, that allow him to look at issues, understand those issues, and try to make the right decisions. That's the process you need to have in place. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that the president uh, will stick with uh, John Kelly in that job. Uh, you know, this president is not somebody who obviously fires people the way others do, despite his uh, background on reality TV. Uh, he, the way he undermines people is by tweeting and criticizing them. Uh, you know, he, he did that with Sessions, he's done that with others. You know, he basically embarrasses them, criticizes them, and ultimately pushes them out that way. Uh, what I've noticed with John Kelly, and I thank God for this, is that he is, he is now kind of pulled back on those kinds of tweets, which may send a signal that uh, that that relationship has gotten better rather than worse. So I, I want to ask you about the broad topic of our, of our gathering this morning, which is the future of democracy, and to ask you um, not about how difficult it is now, we see that, but about how we'd go about putting uh, this country and its political system, its process of governance, uh, back on track, and uh, you're somebody who has special standing in that debate in my book, because as I've written, you're part of what I've described as the great chain of being in our government, of people who came through Congress into OMB and who basically made this system work, made, made things run, made the dollars and cents add up at the end of the day. So um, as you think about uh, an agenda for restoring the health of our, of our, of our democracy, what, what are two or three starting points, uh, Mr. Secretary, that you think we should think about as we head toward the midterms, uh, as, we, as we think about 2020? Look, the most, the most critical thing in our democracy is the ability to govern. Uh, I tell the students at the Panetta Institute that in a democracy, we operate either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, and make no mistake about it, if you're going to lead in this country, you've got to take risks. You've got to take risks. If you're a businessman, you've got to take risks. That's what leadership's all about. But if that leadership is not there for whatever reason, then we will govern by crisis. And we have largely been a country in recent years that is governed by crisis. You have to have a shutdown of the federal government in order for Congress to try to figure out what to do about the budget. Uh, you, you have to have crisis in other areas in order to drive policy. 
And the problem with that is you can operate that way. As an elected official, it's easy to wait for crisis and not have to do anything to anger your, your constituents. But ultimately, there is a price to be paid. And the price is you lose the trust of the American people in our system of governing. And I think that's what the 20, uh, 2016 election was all about, was the lack of trust in Washington and the failure of Washington to deal with the issues that were confronting the American people. I haven't seen that improve. I, in my history, I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. The good news is I have seen Washington work. When I came back, uh, worked as a legislative assistant to Tom Keekle, who was a minority whip to Everett Dirksen in the Senate, uh, there were a number of moderate Republicans. They worked with Democrats like Humphrey and Jackson, and Dick Russell. They worked together on issues. Yes, they had their political differences, but they worked together when it came to issues confronting this country. When I got elected to Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker. He's a Democrat's Democrat. But he got along with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. And did they have their political differences? Of course. But when it came to major issues, they worked together. They were willing to sit down, to negotiate, to respect each other, to develop trust between each other, and to govern the country. That's broken down. That process is broken down. There is no trust. They can't even agree on the facts regarding issues. So there's an unwillingness to sit down and to negotiate and to find compromise and to find consensus. And so you have dysfunction. And it's a dangerous dysfunction. You can't deal with the budget. You can't deal with the debt that's going to become almost a, over 100% of GDP within these next few years. They're not dealing with immigration. They're not dealing with uh, energy issues. They're not dealing uh, with uh, the whole issue of infrastructure and how to improve infrastructure in this country. They're not dealing with the fundamental issues facing our country. So the concern I have is if that dysfunction continues, then I think along with a president who's beginning to withdraw our leadership, from our leadership role in the world, I think that spells a weak America. And that could undermine our democracy for the future. Now, I have great faith in our system. I have great faith uh, in, uh, in the fact that there are communities and states out there and institutions that want to make our, our democracy strong. But I will tell you this, I do not think that our democracy is going to solve its problems from the top down. It's only going to solve its problems from the bottom up which means the election of new individuals who are willing to get back to governing. So let me take that issue uh, head on. There are a lot of people in, in your party, uh, in the Democratic Party, who say we are facing a mortal threat to our institutions, our values. Uh, they, they point to, from immigration to uh, uh, various uh, uh, human rights issues, um, the whole agenda that, sh that you went through. And they say, you know, all this uh, centrist talk about you know, compromise and all that, that's getting us nowhere. We need to be an angry, motivated party. And we need to, to be more prepared to confront uh, the other side. So if Sarah Huckabee Sanders goes to dinner and uh, Lexington, Virginia, well, you know, if the, if the folks there get angry, send her away without her dinner. Uh, if Mitch McConnell's trying to leave his house in the morning, uh, go remind him about uh, immigration issues and uh, a whole series of things like that that are illustrations of this argument that, that to be successful Democrats need to be the, an angry, militant party to rally the country. There's obviously an alternative argument that Democrats should try to be a governing party with a, a broad tent that lots of folks feel comfortable under. But you know, you've heard the argument from those motivated young Democrats. I'm sure you hear it in California. What, what's, what's, your, what's your answer to those folks who say, we've tried that centrist stuff. It doesn't work. We're gonna, let's try being angry. 
Well, if you're angry and you lose, it doesn't mean a damn bit of difference. Uh, the objective has to be about winning. I mean, if, you know, for all of the concern about, uh, you know, uh, Kavanaugh and, and the, or the, the new uh, justice uh, to the Supreme Court, look, the bottom line is that's the result of losing an election. Uh, and the Democrats have lost uh, a major election in this country. And the issue is whether Democrats can win an election. And they can't win if, if they fight Republican extremism with Democratic extremism. The only way you win in this country is by reflecting what America is all about. And America, the America I know, uh, is a country that obviously has vast differences, but at the same time, in terms of values, represents very much the same belief in what this country is all about, uh, in the importance of you know, a job for their families, and the importance of, of uh, decent health care for, uh, for their families, and the importance of educating your children. Uh, in the importance of being able to pull together as a community, in the importance of caring for one another in this country, uh, in the importance of welcoming those who come to this country. I'm the son of Italian immigrants. This is a land of immigrants. So it is those kind of fundamental values that the Democrats have to speak to. It isn't about tearing people up. It isn't about playing the same tactics. It's about providing a message to this country about what we really can be, which is to return to the important values that make our democracy what it is. That's what's at the heart and soul uh, of our country. Look, our, our forefathers had came up with this saying reflecting what you know, what, what America should, uh, should have as its motto, and it's e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Out of many, one. The fact is our differences are not our weakness. Our, dif our differences are our strength. That's what America is all about. But to be able to deal with that, this clash of ideas, which I think is healthy, I think that's what America needs to be. But out of that, we have to be one nation. And that means, yes, that we do have to sit down. We have to listen to one another. And we have to work through and find consensus and compromise and govern this country. That's the message that Democrats are going to have to provide this country. Otherwise, yeah, they can play the same games that Republicans have played. They've now become a one-man party. Uh, they've given up on basic principles that the Republicans are all about, whether it's free trade, whether it's, it's foreign policy, whether it's remaining strong against Russia. Uh, they've given up on a lot of those principles. We can't play the same game. We've got to represent something very different. And, and it's not that different. It is what America really is. Go out in this country. Go to the Midwest. Go to the South. Go to the Northeast. Go to the West. The fact is that deep down there are some fundamental beliefs that pull us together as a society. And that's what you have to appeal to. Again, a, a powerful answer. Uh, I want to take a question that came in um, from our uh, Twitter feed. And it's, it's an interesting question as, as I read it. It's really asking how s sound is this structure that we want to rebuild? Well, how, how bad is the rot? And the way the person uh, uh, phrases this is to ask your view of the stability of our system of checks and balances, the rule of law, and other cornerstones of, of democracy. Are you worried that those have been, have been weakened by these many years of bitter, bitter partisanship? Well, you know, look, there's no question that, uh, as I said, pointing to the dysfunction, uh, that uh, it's been weakened by, by virtue of the inability of presidents and congresses to work together. It didn't just happen with Trump. This goes back a ways. Probably the last 15 years, uh, presidents have found it difficult to work with Congress. Congress has become more partisan. They've engaged in trench warfare. Uh, there has, there's been this inability to sit down 
and really be able to work through uh, those issues. And, and we're seeing that today. At the same time, our forefathers did design a system in which they did not want to locate power in any one branch of government. They didn't want a king, they didn't want a king parliament, they didn't want to start chamber court. And that's the reason they created these three separate but equal branches of government. And those checks and balances are there. Uh, are they always working the way we want? No. Uh, you know, we see what Congress uh, is unable to do. Uh, we don't always agree with the courts, although I have to say that courts are continuing to make decisions that uh, do try to keep us on, on, on the, in the path of the rule of law. But what I really see that I think is, is the great strength of America today is that our institutions of democracy that count today are a free press and the fact that the press continues to present uh, the news to the people. You know, there's obviously with social media and all the other things involved, uh, there's a real competition for just exactly where the truth is. But the fact that we have a free press is extremely important to the debate that needs to take place in this country. We have states that have taken up their responsibility to deal with issues that the federal government, for one reason or another, is not trying to deal with. So we have a number of states dealing with environmental issues, dealing with immigration, dealing with other challenges that uh, the federal government has not been helpful on, but they're doing it. I see communities, we've, we've seen comments about communities across this country where, yeah, there are Democrats and Republicans. There are people that support Trump. There are people that support uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders. But the fact is in these communities, they're able to sit down and to develop approaches to trying to improve what's going on in these communities, whether it's in housing, whether it's in transportation, whether it's in health care. And there are other institutions in our democracy uh, that, are, that are working as well. So I, I think because of those institutions, and look, we're all being tested. All of us as citizens are being tested. And in many ways, the question is whether we're willing to step up and do what we have to do in order to try to make sure that our country stays on the right path. So we're all being tested, but I have fundamental confidence in the underlying strength of this country because I really do believe that deep down, Americans share a common spirit, common sense, dedication, to what this country is all about. And the reason is because as Secretary of Defense, I saw those values in the men and women that served this country. I looked them in the eye. These are young people that are willing to fight and die for this country. Understand that. They're willing to fight and die for this country. And if they're willing to do that, if they're willing to do everything necessary to protect this country, then I don't see why we as citizens can't reflect the same courage in terms of our democracy. Are you sure you're not ready to run again? <laughs> I like being 3,000 miles from Washington. <laughs> So uh, I want to uh, stick with this question of damage to uh, our institutions. Maybe this is a, a, a last question, but it, it goes to an area that you came to know and, and love, I think, and that's our intelligence agencies. Uh, you said you, nobody was more surprised than you when you were asked to be CIA director, but I remember when you came in, that agency... Uh, you know, was it, it acted as if, it, as if it had a little sign on its backside that said, kick me. And, and you gave them some protection and cover. And uh, that was a period of, of rebuilding. And we're, we've been in a period where the president, uh, in an extraordinary way, uh, has uh, publicly attacked our intelligence and law enforcement agencies um, talked about the FBI in ways I could never imagine an American president 
speaking, uh, talked about the NSA similarly as engaged in massive abuse uh, for a time was attacking the CIA and its professionals. So I want to ask you, uh, since you were part of that world, uh, and I'm sure stay connected with it, what damage has all that done? As people listen to these comments coming from the President of the United States uh, week after week, what, what, what effect does that have? And, and again, how do, how do we think about repairing that so that we get what we want, which is independent, professional, self-confident, uh, law-abiding uh, intelligence and law enforcement? Well, look, I mean, let's establish the basic premise. This country cannot protect itself cannot defend the interests of the American people uh, without the rule of law uh, and without a strong national security, uh, a strong defense force that can help protect this country from our adversaries. And critical to that is the ability to get the best intelligence possible on what our adversaries and others are up to. Uh, knowledge is critical to the ability to protect our country. That's what intelligence is all about. That's what, that's what the CIA and all of the intelligence agencies are all about. That's what NSA is all about. Uh, it's the importance of being able to determine what others are doing that can impact on our national security interests. And that doesn't just happen. That isn't something where you can just pick up, you know, the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and figure out what's happening in the rest of the world. That means you're going to have to put people in dangerous places in order to be able to determine what really is happening. Uh, you've got to be able to deploy agents. You've got to be able to conduct operations. Uh, that uh, can uh, provide uh, the best kind of, of information possible. And so people are putting their lives on the line in order to be able to gather that kind of intelligence. That's what it's all about. I talked about our men and women in uniform. The fact is uh, that the men and women who serve in our intelligence agencies, and for that matter our law enforcement agencies, put their lives on the line. And when a president criticizes uh, our intelligence uh, and our intelligence operations, then clearly it impacts on the morale of those people that are out there putting their lives on the line. I mean, they're, they're basically asking the question, wait a minute, I'm out here. Uh, I'm taking risks every day. I'm providing valuable information. Uh, and now I hear the president of the United States uh, basically criticizing uh, the importance of that information and criticizing what I do. It makes it that much tougher to try to attract people who are willing then to go out into those tough positions and be able to do what is necessary to do. Now, look, I have tremendous confidence in the people that are part of our intelligence agencies. I know they're continuing to put their lives on the line. They're continuing to gather that information. They're continuing to provide that kind of important intelligence. The reality is, after 9-11, we recognize that intelligence in many, many ways failed uh, to be able to determine what our enemies were up to. And the result of that is that we really did improve the intelligence operations in this country. We put them together. They're willing to share information. They're willing to work together. And I think in many ways, because of those operations, we've been able to protect this country since 9-11. Uh, uh, since but it is a continuing challenge. And so my hope is that, uh, that the president uh, now understands that uh, whatever problems he may have had with intelligence in the past, the reality is he cannot do his job without the men and women in the intelligence operations who are putting their lives in line in order to make sure that they provide the information that's critical to our national security.
So when I talk with uh, Secretary uh, Panetta, I, I, I think of, uh, as they say in church on Sunday, the law and the prophets. And, uh, you know, this is, you, you take us to, back to fundamentals about how our, how our country uh, works. We're really grateful that you're willing to take this time this morning to be with us and uh, share such honest and, and, you know, thoughts really worth thinking about. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Coming up tonight on C-SPAN 3, former White House advisor Ben Rhodes looks at the legacy of the Obama administration. Republic